Ladies and gentlemen, the Military Child Education Coalition President and CEO, Dr. Becky Porter. Welcome back. This afternoon we're in for a treat. Think about this quote from our next speaker. All television is educational. The question is, what is it teaching? At a time when media content has never been more prevalent in the lives of children and teens, that really is a question worth considering. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to sit down with our next speaker to talk about the power of storytelling and a parent's role in the digital age. Dr. Yalda Ulls is a research scientist at UCLA and founder of the Center for Scholars and Storytellers. Let's listen to what she had to say. Welcome everyone. I'm so happy today to be able to introduce our next presenter. Yalda T. Ulls, PhD, is a research scientist at UCLA and a nonprofit founder the Center for Scholars and Storytellers. She has over 15 years of senior executive experience in the entertainment industry with MGM and Sony. Her expertise of how media content is created, as well as the science of how media affects children, informs her unique perspective. So without further delay, I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Ulls. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Becky. Um, and I, uh, this is my second time uh, presenting to this group. Last time was a few years ago. Things were a lot different. It was in person, um, but I'm honored and thrilled to share some of the work that I do, both on behalf of teaching children how to be safe in the digital world and also on helping storytellers, people who create content, um, on how to create content that impacts youth positively. So I'm going to share my screen now and I will um, give you a little presentation and I wish I could answer questions live, but um, I'm sure um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to the email at the end of this presentation and I'd be happy to answer anything. Um, so, as I said, my name is uh, Yelda T. Ulls, and, and as you heard, I used to be a film exec, more on that in a minute. Um, and this presentation is called The Power of Storytelling. Um, so we'll start with a little bit about my background because it is very unique and informs my perspective. Um, and I'll talk about why storytelling, why I care so much about storytelling and media um, and tell you about the nonprofit I found, found the Center for Scholars and Storytellers. And then we'll talk a little bit about child development, real basic stuff about what happens at different ages and stages and how that impacts um, how child development and media intersect and how um, parents might be able to support their children in the digital world, which is now way more digital than even when I did it two or three years ago due to COVID. Um, so my background is I was a movie executive. Um, if you know the, uh, the movie database, IMDB, Independent Movie Database, um, you can go on there and my maiden name was Tehranian and you can see I was the executive and a producer on some of these movies and the very first movie I made was called My Family or Mi Familia um, and it was an intergenerational story of three generations of Mexican Americans um, and it was about the immigrant experience and I am a child of immigrants. My parents immigrated from Iran and the producer was Francis Ford Coppola, also a child of immigrants. Um, and it, the reason I tell you all that is because um, this story, which resonated so much to me, was not about my culture, but it was about family and the immigrant experience. And, you know, storytelling is just powerful because it's about the human experience. Um, one of the things that I always was drawn to when I became a uh, student and getting my doctoral degree um, was translating the science for lay audiences. So while I was at UCLA, I worked um, to teach students and to my to teach myself how to translate psychological research so people could use it in their daily lives. And in particular, I was interested in supporting parents with my field of expertise media 
um, as I am a parent, my parents, uh, my children are now 18 and 21, and they have survived. And I was able to apply everything that I learned in my PhD program to them. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and I wrote a book called Media Moms and Digital Dads, A Fact Not Fear Approach to Parenting in the Digital Age, that was really a translation of research and applied to how to help parents um, navigate these tricky waters. So first I'm gonna talk about storytelling and why it's more important than ever in an overly saturated media world. As you all know, media is basically something none of us can seem to get away from. Um, and that's not so bad because actually media messages have a lot of power to shape culture for social good. Um, and one example around gender is that a few decades ago, when you would ask children, you would ask them, and this came from science, to draw a picture of a scientist, and they didn't gender it. Only 1% of all children drew female scientists. But today, 28% of all girls, uh, all children um, draw female scientists, meaning that you know, they now believe women can be scientists, which they didn't in the past. And a large part of that is attributed to um, television, books, media, uh, images, because that is one of the best ways to learn about different careers if you don't have a direct role model. But at the same time, of course, media can also promote harmful um, content. And this is a quote from a formal F former FTC chairman, who said that all TV is educational, question is what is it teaching? So it's really important that we consider when content creators create media and when parents are choosing media for your, their kids, that you focus on the positive content and minimize the harmful content. And it's even more important today, and this is pre-COVID, there's more channels dedicated solely to kids than ever before. And with YouTube, there's tons and tons of channels there. They're spending more times on screen and there's more channels every day. I mean, probably 40% of Netflix business is kids stuff. So if you think about it, um, you know, all of this content's being created to target your kids and it's made for kids, so it's really important for parents to pay attention to it. And the other big thing that's changed is mobile technology. So this is the world we were in pre-COVID. It's probably the world we're going back to. Um, and smartphone ownership just has grown at a phenomenal rate. I mean, in, two, in 2007, the iPhone was introduced. In 2008, it had already penetrated 11% of the U.S. owned smartphones, but now everybody owns them. So it's just been going, um, it's been go, actually, this is age, eight-year-olds, 11% of eight-year-olds own smartphones in 2015. Um, and now today, 20% of them do. And, it, and at the older ages, almost everybody does. And in 2014, the number of mobile devices worldwide surpassed the number of people. So you can imagine there are more mobile devices than there are toilets. Um, and this really, really is what was a game changer with media. We can watch it anytime, anywhere, any place. And that's why we exist. The Center for Scholars and Storytellers, which is the organization I founded at UCLA, we exist to bring together researchers and storytellers to support positive youth development for tweens, teens, and young adults. And we work together, both content creators, young people, and academics to um, unlock the power of entertainment media to help the next generation thrive and grow. And we we focus on youth because that's where many of them are. They're on screens and this is a very sensitive developmental stage. Early childhood is very um, sensitive from a developmental um, and from a neuro from the brain perspective. Um, adolescence is also a very important stage. There's a lot going on, a lot of changes. And they're on screens and they're on them with their friends. And sometimes that's more important than anything else in their world. So if we can get to them through the media, they're already spending most of their time on. Um, hopefully we can really maximize how, how this content impacts them. So the center is a mixture of um, academics and of content people. These are some of the um, academic collaborators. We have over 50 people that um, work with us um, from all sorts of different universities. 
Um, and we also collaborate with all sorts of entertainment people, many, many different companies, producer of 13 Reasons Why, we've done things around foster care, we've done things around gender roles, and we get select. Um, thankfully, we've been getting support from many celebrities to support us. And we do a lot of thought leadership. We've um, been lucky enough to be in the news quite a bit. We've been we've done an event with the TV Academy. We do all sorts of different events. They're all free. There's a lot of free content on our site. Um, many of them are for content creators, but they also apply to parenting. Um, okay, so now I'm going to move over to the next part of this talk, which is looking at general child development. Some of this you may know, but some of this you may not. Um, so each age and stage is different, as you know, and I'm going to start with the ages where media starts becoming more important. So I'm starting with childhood or preschool years from three to five years old. And during this stage, it's really important for them to learn how to move their bodies, motor skills they're called, and speak language. Play is very important to them. Caregivers who is in their life is extremely important. And their task at this age beyond play is to learn basic social rules like sitting, taking my turn, sharing. Um, and that's really challenging. They don't learn that um, necessarily at home. They start to learn it at preschool. As they get a little bit older, they start to understand, oh, you know, at six, six years old, they start to understand other people. Um, theory of mind comes into place. They realize people think differently, that maybe they one way they behave at home is not the same way they should behave in a different area. They start having um, becoming um, more and more logical. Um, they're starting to pay attention to their friends, although adults are still the most important, and they're really attuned to rules. So it's a really good age for us setting up rules and having them listen. And it doesn't prepare you at all for the next stage, which is a very challenging stage. Um, for the early adolescents, so much is changing for them. They're figuring out how to navigate. Biologically, they're changing. They're in puberty. Often their social cognition turns on. They start thinking about um, the social world in a way they've never had before. They realize other people have different opinions of them and that there are rules that they need to follow. They're very attuned to popularity and image. Um, sometimes they're changing schools. It's a very, very challenging age, and it's challenging for adults, too. And, of course, this is when their media use ramps up, so it's often where I get the most questions. Um, and then, finally, adolescence, uh, 13 to 15, brain activity, lots of things changing. They pay actually more attention to risk and reward, um, you know, and you can see this in their brain, so that's why they're doing kind of things that we consider crazy. They believe the reward will be bigger and the risk will be smaller than we do. Um, but part of the reason they need to do this is because they're building up to leave the house. And it takes a lot of um, courage and, and ability to want the reward of leaving the home, to, to put yourself in the risky position of leaving home. So it's actually all developmentally normal. Um, they're developing their identity, they're considering intimacy, they're comparing themselves to everybody else, and they're separating from parents and caregivers. And as they get, you know, older in their older adolescence, even though they look like adults, they still care a lot about friends. They still are teenagers. They're still figuring out who they are. Their, their brains are still changing. So it's really important to remember that they're not adults yet even though they wanna tell you they are. So all of this means um, parenting in the digital age, it, your role is more important than ever. Um, but first I wanna tell you, um, and you'll, you can read more about this in my book if you get it, um, that worrying about newer media is nothing new in the turn of the century, um, 19th century, parents were really worried about a new media that teenagers loved. Um, and this happens over and over again. Parents, adults get worried about new media because it's something new to them and kids just take to it. To them, it's just part of their lives. And we all worry because we're not used to that sort of overwhelming urge to be with that media. But back then, this media was books. Five cent novels read by too many American boys. This was actually in a newspaper um, where um, they were writing about boys spending too much time in libraries reading. I don't think anyone worries about that now, um, but back then they worried about it. They thought it was really, really bad for kids to be reading. 
And yet we've adapted to the point where we all really want our kids to read. So these, this is just a natural flow. We freak out about the new media. We start to adapt. Our kids know it better than us. And then they move on and we move on. So as we are all adapting to the media world, I think you, trusting your kids' instincts on some level is, is important. And it's also important to know that the reason I went through all those developmental um, tasks and what was happening at each of those ages and stages is research is finding that's not changing. Kids are still the same they always have been, and they still need the things they always did. But what they're, the medium, the platform, the media that they're using and the technology around them is changing. But what they need and what they want is not. Um, so early to mid childhood is is you know one phase of their media journey, and one of the most important things at every age and stage, but particularly early on before they have their media, is to think about role modeling. You know, parents are often on their phones and their devices, and kids don't have them, and they're watching you, and they feel left out. Then they start feeling curious, then they want that media, and then when they get their own devices, they won't let go of it, particularly if that's what you've role modeled. So it's really important to put the phone down um, during you know, family bonding time, perhaps during dinner. Um, make sure that your child feels seen and is not distracted by the um, phone, you using the phone. Um, doesn't mean you can't be on your phone and, uh, and be on your computers, but Find times where you can put it down and you can model that it's really important when you're talking to someone to look them in the eye and have a conversation. Now, one thing I always get asked is how much time can kids, um, should kids be on media? But more and more, and even the American Pediatric Association is saying this, we, we're moving away from time limits and asking adults to think about the four C's child, who the child is. Some children, for example, neurodiverse children, autistic children might be more comfortable on screens and might actually learn things from screens while other kids may not. What's the context? If you look at this photo at the bottom, this kid is on his um, iPad, you know, outside at the beach, you know, why with sunglasses on and a pacifier, that's not necessarily the context. If you compare it to this other boy, up on the left, he's, um, or at my left, he is um, on it, learning, engaging with an adult, and um, that's a different context. Um, and one is superior to the other from a learning perspective. Um, content is also important. It's really important to think about high quality content. This one, Daniel Tiger's Griffic Feelings is really important. And then communication, using the screen and using it not to be antisocial, but using it sometimes to be social, which really came into, um, you know, sharp point during COVID that we were using it without this, this screen, we wouldn't be able to communicate with others. So, you know, remembering it's a communication tool as well as many or other things. Um, and the ways for, for adults to help children get the most out of the media to, they consume is one way is to do active mediation. So what that means is that you're actively positive with your child about their um, their uh, content, about, um, you know, not always saying, oh, you're on your screen again, what video game are you doing, blah, 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 but say, oh, I'm really interested, what are you doing? But at the same time, say, set limits. Oh, you've been on the screen for a while, now you need to go outside, let's go do something else. Um, you can't watch that show. Um, that's the time that it's, it correlates to authoritative parenting, um, which is where you are very loving, but you also have rules. You can't, if, if you let kids do whatever they want, they don't feel safe and they don't learn. And if you are too strict and you're negative, they end up, it ends up backfiring and limiting their ability to critically think. Um, speaking of critically think, introduce media literacy so you can start to help them think critically about the content. And in the classroom, teachers can also teach about media literacy, um, and you should encourage your schools to do that. 
And then social, we were talking about communication. If you can sit down with your child and watch some of it and talk about it, help them understand what's on the screen. They don't get it for a really long time. It takes them a long time to understand that the screen is telling them something about the real world. And so to do that, you can connect what's on screen to the off screen world. So if they see something blue on the screen, show them the color blue off screen so they can see that the character that is saying the word blue or the color blue actually means something in their day to day life. And you can do that with dialogical reading techniques. And I'm going to give you an example. So this is a show called Curious George. Um, and you would be so when George went to space, he seemed surprised. So you're labeling the emotion and you're then describing what that means. He opened his eyes wide and his mouth fell open. So the child doesn't automatically know that a mouth open and eyes wide means surprise. If they don't know what surprise means, you help them. Then you help them connect it to their own life. Can you make a surprise face? Now let's pretend we were on board George's rocket. How would you feel when you flew into space? Would that show me with, could you show me with your face? This is sort of using techniques to connect um, what the child is seeing with their own selves and then having open-ended sort of questions to let them explore um, rather than telling them very specifically what they do, what to do. But I mentioned before at early adolescence, the tween teen years is when we all start to worry about content. Um, and the first thing to, to think about is that kids don't use all this media because they're addicted to technology. They're addicted to their friends, and that is developmentally normal. Remember that age and stage, which I think I'm going to show you again right here? Peer influence starts to become more important, and they're pushing away adults. And that's the time when they're getting their phones, and they're getting on social media, and their social cognition, they're thinking about, oh, how is this appear socially? And they're comparing themselves to others. So it's a lot going on. And now we've introduced media into it in addition to puberty and you know, learning about the social world and new schools, now there's media. And so what that means is that the digital world, world puts some pressure on typical things that kids are going through. So for example, they care a lot about friends, but now there's peer pressure everywhere. They can be watching stuff. There's FOMO, fear of missing out. They think they have to respond. Something they could do, a risky thing or something, you know, really rewarding that, you know, is not uh, sanctioned can be caught on camera. It, they, it's all image, you know, Instagram is all about image, what you look like. So they're already image driven because that's what they're, you know, trying to figure out. And yet they're in this world where image is everything. They can watch other people. Um, they can expose themselves and get a lot of feedback. Hopefully some of that feedback is positive, but it can be negative. And they have a lot more access to a whole bunch of different kinds of friends, which again can be both positive and negative. And in fact, the research finds, and I authored this um, article called Benefits and Costs of Social Media in Adolescence for Pediatrics, which is a um, journal art, uh, for the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, that um, all of these processes are critical to healthy growth and identity development, that, that you know, they use the online environment to reinforce and build their relationships offline. It can make them feel better about themselves. It can make them have a lot more people to be connected to. It's almost safer identity exploration because you're on a screen. Um, there's a lot of social support. Most teens re report that there's much more kindness and social support than negative stuff. Um, and there's more opportunity to disclose how they feel, which um, can make them feel closer to people. But of course, there are also some costs. Cyberbullying is certainly an issue. Um, around one out of five kids report to be cyberbullied. Um, they can be exposed to developmentally inappropriate content. So, um, that happens for sure. Um, and it's important to help them understand what's appropriate and what's inappropriate and help them understand their own feelings around it. Um, it can be lead to depression. It can often lead to social anxiety and um, social anxiety can cause some insecure teens and often more girls and boys um, to want to be on their social media all the time. They're anxious that they're being left out and they need to see what everyone else is doing. And that can be a dangerous um, cycle. 
One consistent research finding is, um, and this could lead to some of those negative findings, some of the depression, some of the anxiety, is that a lot of kids um, use their phones at night when they should be sleeping. Um, so they're, most of them are watching it before bedtime. Um, some kids don't turn off their phones and they leave it on. And if they turn it off, it's actually correlated with one more hour of sleep. And lack of sleep can significantly impact mental health. All of the research now has found that uh, sleep is one of the most important things you can do for both your physical and mental health. And it's really important in adolescence. So it's important to help your child recognize if the um, their media use is impacting their sleep and how that might impact their behavior and their performance. Um, Another thing I want to share with you is that the research on video games is actually quite positive. Uh, we often focus on negative findings and talk about addiction and aggression, but the reality is there's actually more findings on video games that are positive, providing that it's high quality content, and they can often be social. And in today's world, when kids were not able to hang out with each other, it was one of the only ways many kids could connect was on video games, playing video games. Um, and in fact, for girls, they're even more positive. Um, kids who play video games test higher on um, uh, spatial learning and on mental rotation. And these are components that underlie um, learning in math and science. So video games have gotten a bum rap, and I hope you'll consider um, thinking about um, your child using and playing with high quality video games. Um, so we talked about time limits. People are always asking me about time limits. And again, we are not recommending, most most people do not recommend that you sit set very strict time limits because you want your child to make smart choices with their content. So emphasize balance over time limits, emphasize content over time limits, what they're actually consuming. Is it a high quality show or media that they're listening to? Um, and this little um, graph might be good. And it sort of shows you like, um, you know, okay, I spend 40 minutes watching Netflix. I'm actually good. But if I'm spending three hours binging it, maybe it's not so good. This is how it makes me feel. Have them start thinking about how it makes them feel and what else they're doing. And this little quiz um, hopefully will make you feel better. What two teens say they use their cell phone the most for? Um, connect with other people, learn new things, avoid interacting with others, or texting their caregivers. And they actually say they use their cell phone the most to connect with other people. Again, reinforming that they're not addicted to technology, they're addicted to their friends. Um, this is one uh, resource on our website at the Center for Scholars and Storytellers. I'm not gonna go through the content, but there is some um, information in here that will um, help you if you're interested. Uh, learn about some tools and tricks for different ages um, about using um, media to teach character strengths and teach your children different lessons. Um, we did some research where we found that um, when parents are talking to the kids about how the content teaches them, how it is valuable, what the lessons are in it, when they talk to them about it, um, it's it's really, really helpful. And sometimes it's more helpful. Some of you may know you can use media to actually teach something. They'll listen when you're talking about the character and not when the, you're talking about them. Um, and this is downloadable at scholarsandstorytellers.com slash research reports. Uh, and this is my book, Media Moms and Digital Dads. Here are some of the um, reviews. Um, and I was really grateful that, um, you know, collective parental sigh of belief. It, this is what I was hoping for, commonsensical wrap-ups, takeaways, easy to use. Um, I hope that um, if you get it, it's a useful resource for you. And remember, you got this, you're doing great. You're, you know, you trust your parenting instincts. Um, you know, as long as you're thinking about what you're role modeling, you're talking to your child, you're being transparent, you're open, you're, you know, trusting them, letting them sort of um, giving them autonomy, developmentally appropriate autonomy so that they're taking steps forward with you knowing you're there to help them. Um, you will 
your child will do it. My child, by the way, just to tell you a little story, my son played video games from a very young age. And at one point I was worried he was addicted. He was on it all the time. And because of my research, I realized it was all okay. And he's now going to Columbia and he was the uh, valedictorian of his class. And I actually believe that video games helped him learn quite a bit. So um, trust your instincts. And thank you. And if you're interested in contacting me and asking any questions, please reach out at info at scholarsandstorytellers.com. Okay, that's my talk. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Ols. That was really um, enlightening. And I, I love how um, how really what you're talking about and your book and your research all really speaks to the theme for our for our seminar, which is making kids milk kids and other military and other kids college work and life ready. I mean, when you talk about character development and positive youth development and how media can really um, kind of elevate that, it really is exciting. I'm so glad that you were able to, to share that with us today. Um, thanks so much. Oh, sure. I'm so glad. And, and I, I appreciate being asked back. And I love that you guys respond to this message. Some parents and some adults get so worried. They, they get very, very anxious and that anxiety sort of doesn't allow them to be there for their kids. So I'm, I'm glad that your, your constituents are interested in this message and, and because that's when you'll get the most out of this new world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for being here today. And um, we look forward to inviting you back again. Again, I want to thank Dr. Olds for sharing her insights and strategies with us. I think she's really given us a lot to think about, especially when considering what healthy media consumption looks like for the young people in our lives. Join us back here at 2.30 Eastern for our closing session. You won't want to miss a great discussion featuring Nora O'Donnell. She's the anchor and managing editor of the CBS Evening News, and will also talk to other now adult military kids who share their experiences and share what, they're, what they've learned growing up in military families. Later, we present our final awards for the year. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden joins us to recognize the MSEC Student to Student Teams of the Year. Take some time now to review the vendor booths, check out our Call for the Arts winners, and learn more about our amazing sponsors. We'll see you at 2.30 Eastern.